Hindi. He he's a good friend, uh, not long time friend, but I think good friend, and he has a very important story, personal story, to share with us today, and uh, it's a story that happens uh, in Congo, but uh, it really is a story that it's happening very near all of us. It's a story that it's happening on my cell phone right now, on your cell phone, on your computer, uh, on many of the things that make this event and that make our daily life and more important, they make a very different daily life for many people. It's a story we should all be aware of and, uh, and then uh, we must, every one of us, think what uh, we can do about it if we think we should do something about it. So I really want to thank Bandi for being here with us. He came from London and uh, I don't want to take more of his time. Just thanks. for. Well, I'll go up on stage because uh, I've got my material. Well, the topic I'm going to talk to you about is uh, a very difficult topic for me, uh, and it's really close to my heart. Um, and I will relate it to you the best as I can. Now, 21 years ago, uh, I left my country, uh, my home country, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where I was a student activist. I went to the UK to apply for asylum. Uh, I was really quite uh, frightened because it was the first time for me to leave uh, the Congo. Um, and just like many people uh, who are originally from the Congo, uh, I had to run away because of political uh, persecution. Now, for the last 21 years, I've been living in the United Kingdom, uh, precisely in Perfleet, uh, and I work in London. And for the last uh, several months, I've decided to really to speak out about the issues that are happening in the Congo. Uh, and I'm here today to really talk to you about the situation in the Congo and what is happening over there. So it's quite clear what the Congo has got to do with me. But I want to tell you what the Congo has got to do with you, uh, with us uh, and with our world uh, as we know it. But first of all, I really want to ask you a favor. Uh, and I do this whenever I speak. Can you please reach into your pockets or your bags uh, and just hold your telephone with you? Uh, and if you have a laptop or any other technological equipment, just hold it with you. Just notice how your finger slides towards the buttons and how connected you are with your mobile phones or your technology. Now, all this technology really help us in many ways. They help us to stay close, in touch with our families, uh, with our friends, uh, and we use it for many, many reasons, uh, for our work, for our social life. Uh, and one thing I want to ask you, can you, for one moment, imagine your life without those mobile phones and computers? Now, it would be good if uh, the story ended there. Uh, but unfortunately, what you hold in your hands, you know, uh, computers and laptops, um, have actually created uh, a lot of difficulties, a lot of problems in the Congo. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about. And it's down to four minerals, uh, tin, tungsten, tantalum, and gold. Now, tantalum in particular, uh, is known in the Congo as coltan. It is an anti-corrosive. It's a heat conductor. Uh, and it's actually responsible for the miniaturization of everything. Uh, so it's thanks to the tantalum that we are able to get 
uh, our technology in very small size uh, and it really makes it easier for manufacturers to manufacture smaller and smaller technology thanks to tantalum because it's a very good heat conductor and it is so effective that it can even be used in uh, medical equipment such as implants and be put in the human body. It's also used in aerospace and in many forms of technology. So it's, it's, it's good, it's a good, good mineral that is beneficial uh, for the entire world. But unfortunately, the quest to extract this mineral has actually led to a very uh, devastating effect in the Congo. The minerals are, or the mines are controlled by rebel groups, by armed groups. Some of them actually belong to the National Army. Others are part of rebel groups, and they have, uh, they have committed a lot of atrocities, which include uh, raping women. They've used rape as a weapon of war, to the extent that every year, over 400,000 women die. Sorry, are raped every year. 400,000 women are raped. And uh, still counting, Five million people have already died since 1996. It also means that armed groups are going around and forcibly recruiting children and getting them into the army. And if you count approximately how many of those children are being forced to fight in militia groups, you have almost 30,000 children. Internally, because of the conflict, which is actually fueled in large part in, um, in, in, the, in the trade, in the illicit trade, uh, because, of, because of the extraction, because of the, the illicit trade, armed groups are able to, to finance the war and continue to create havoc within the Congo. So, in a sense, uh, this mineral not only is it good, but it's also creating problems on the ground in the Congo. Now, something that has happened, not only is the National Army uh, not being able to control uh, its own high commanding officers who are then controlling the mines uh, in the Congo, what is also happening is that the minerals are being smuggled out of the Congo. And once they're smuggled out of the Congo, they're ending up in Rwanda. And Rwanda is then disguising the minerals as if they were from Rwanda and selling them outside uh, Rwanda. So if you estimate how much of that is being sold, smuggled out of the Congo, and sold out as if they were Rwandan minerals, you have about 50%. So Rwanda has actually made a lot of profits out of the illicit trade within the illicit trade of minerals within the Congo. Now, the other bad thing that is also happening is that uh, one main group, one main rebel group, uh, which is creating havoc within the Congo, especially in the east of the Congo, is actually being supported by Rwanda. But thankfully, many Western governments are now uh, imposing sanctions on Rwanda. Uh, for instance, they've cut, some of them have cut aid, others have suspended it pending review. So in a sense, because of the campaign, because of all the investigations that are being carried out, all the reports that are being published, some actions are being taken in terms of stopping the smuggling, in terms of actually uh, showing the effect of the illicit mineral trade within the whole region of, uh, of, of the Great Lakes of Africa. Now, obviously, obviously, it's not the only solution. Conflict 
making sure that conflict minerals do not, do not land in our electronics is not the only solution. There are many ways that can be used in order to stop the war within the Congo. But it's one of the ways that we can ensure that uh, the money that is made from minerals, the minerals trade does not land in the wrong hands and does not finance the war within the Congo. And that can be done quite effectively. In fact, this is not new to the Congo. At the beginning of the 20th century, King Leopold II was the sole, the only, was the sole owner of the whole country. And during his time, there was technological innovation. In those days, the automobile industry was picking up in the West, particularly, and rubber was needed. And there was a lot of money to be made through the rubber trade. And what was happening then was that a lot of people were being maimed if you did not reach the quota that was set for you. Uh, and as a result of the exhaustion that happened, a, a, about 10 million people died in the Congo. And what took place at the beginning of the 20th century is also happening now because now we have about 5 million people who have already died. And this is also fueled by the fact that uh, technology is actually uh, putting pressure on, on a lot of companies to be able to get the raw materials they need in order to manufacture the technology. So it happened then at the beginning of the 20th century. However, what stopped the atrocities at the beginning of the 20th century was the fact that there was international outcry. Because of the international outcry that took place, people like you and me spoke about it, but particularly Britain led the campaign against the atrocities that were happening in the Congo. The atrocities ended. So now we need the same kind of international outcry to take place. And the only way we can generate that, it's actually through using the same kind of technology that is actually bringing the situation to our attention, to the world's attention. So you use technology as an antidote. The very venom, you use it actually to bring an international outcry so that the atrocities, there will be a lot of momentum built around that so that the atrocities can end in the Congo. Now, there have, we have encouraging signs. For instance, the OECD, the uh, Organization of European uh, Cooperation, uh, Development and Cooperation, or maybe the other way around, has actually put in place guidelines as to how to uh, exclude conflict mi uh, minerals from the supply chains of companies. Uh, so that means that any company which potentially can be using conflict materials in their supply chains would then make sure, would then make sure to trace the raw materials, the minerals, to their mines of origin. And in this case, if it was Congo, then they would be able to trace it back to Congo, which mine that uh, the, the minerals came from, and they will know whether that area is militarized or it is not militarized. That's number one. Number two, what the OECD uh, has advocated is that there has to be a risk assessment to be carried out to ensure that the sale of those minerals are not actually benefiting to illegal armed groups. So which would mean that if you're a company, you will ensure that you're carrying out a risk assessment which will help you to prevent financing uh, any illegal armed groups. The third thing that they've advocated is to, um, companies should commission independent audit. And through the independent audit, we would know whether you've actually carried out what you're supposed to carry out in order to prevent 
uh, financing uh, any conflict. And the fourth thing, which is very important, is for companies to disclose all the steps they've carried out in order to prevent conflict minerals from uh, being in their supply chains. So once all those things are done, and once all the companies abide by that, the hope is that uh, we're not inadvertently financing the war in the Congo. Now, the same guidelines were endorsed by the UN. The UN has actually passed a resolution to actually have the, this policy uh, implemented by its member states. Interestingly, the US has already passed a domestic law called the Dodd-Frank, and this uh, domestic law within the US uh, needed another set of regulations from the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission to actually set out how, in practice, companies would implement this due uh, diligence process. And they've, they've just recently uh, passed or actually uh, published what it would mean in practice for companies. And that w came out yesterday. So all of us in the conflict, the, in the conflict minerals campaign, we are uh, reading to know the details of what the regulations would be in terms of uh, technology companies, how they're going to ensure that they are abiding by the due diligence process. Now, from first impression, two things are going to happen for US-based companies. The, the, the first thing that is going to happen for US-based companies is that for uh, two years, the large companies will get ready to ensure that they're not having conflict minerals in their supply chains. And for smaller companies, they will have four years in which to prepare. Now, obviously, uh, the ideal situation would have been to actually have the implementation of such a, a, a very good policy implemented immediately. It's going to take a number of years for it to take place, but already we have signs that some companies are actually starting to change the way they are sourcing their minerals. So they, that's very encouraging. So instead of actually waiting until they are forced by law to do it, they're already gearing up towards uh, implementing this due diligence process, which we believe will make a significant impact in the war in the Congo. Now, what took place at the beginning of the 20th century needs to happen now. And the uh, conflict minerals campaign is actually one of the ways to actually mobilize all of us to start putting pressure on technology companies, on us as consumers, to then know what is happening and the effects of the technology we have, so that once we are more aware of it, we can then start exerting pressure. Now, for, for Congo itself, it's a country that is very wealthy. It is estimated that a Congo is worth over $23 trillion, but yet, remarkably, its population is very poor, um, and life ex expectancy is very low. And for the miners that mine, extract those minerals, uh, they only earn an, an average of $2 uh, uh, a day, which is insignificant in terms of uh, what they're actually extracting and how much uh, a lot of those uh, rebel groups are making at the back of those min uh, miners. <clears throat> now, there are also the fact that, th there is also the fact that uh, technology has itself helped the Congo in the way uh, that it has functioned. Uh, during the last uh, uh, elections, which happened uh, at the end of last year, what happened was that uh, the government put out 
uh, elections results that were actually not reflecting what people were able to collate on the grounds. Uh, so uh, people, because of the technology that we now have, which is actually very accessible to the people, they were able to get the evidence uh, from various uh, places in the country. Uh, and the Congo is actually the size of Western Europe. So, which means that from one end to another, you needed to actually, it was a, a logistical nightmare. But because of the technology, they were able to record the evidence and then prove that the, uh, the elections were undemocratic. And as a result, uh, outside, um, outside the Congo, the diaspora demonstrated and denounced the results, but also they were joined by uh, international observers, such as the Carter Center and the Catholic Church in denouncing the results, uh, and to the effect that those results were deemed uh, uh, not credible. And this could not have happened uh, without the technology. And we have other evidence where technology has actually helped. Uh, for instance, in places like Tunisia and uh, Egypt, uh, the demonstrators uh, were only able to communicate effectively because of technology. So we look at technology as a force for good, and we want to harness technology in order to make change happen in the Congo. And we can only do it if we seize on the opportunity that on the opportunities that technology is giving us. At the beginning of the 20th century, it took uh, months, years, to compile the evidence because Congo is such a large, vast country uh, to move from one place to another without roads, uh, without, place, uh, without proper infrastructure. It took years to, to demonstrate that the atrocities were happening. Now, because of technology, we can actually demonstrate quite easily because even for people who live in remote areas, many of them have mobile phones. Many of them can quickly pass on the news from wherever they may be in the Congo to say, look, killings are happening in such and such village uh, and we need help. So technology can help and indeed, it has helped for many of us who uh, are from those uh, countries to actually help us to bring peace. So we are then faced with a paradox. On the one hand, technology uh, can be an instrument of oppression. But on the other, technology is an instrument of freedom. So through technology, we can gain our freedom. And that's indeed what we've been doing in the Congo. So, the mobilization that has been happening has been happening through technology. And me being here is actually a way for me to publicize, to make it public what is happening in the Congo and how we can use technology to create this international outcry that we need. But Congo cannot do it alone. Just like uh, the Congolese proverb says, a human being does not wash their face with one finger. We need five. With five fingers, we can wash our face. And for me, five fingers really represent uh, five continents. And five continents represent the whole of humanity. And the whole of humanity uh, needs to come together to solve this problem in the Congo. Now, you may be wondering in your head, what can you do, you, as a private citizen? What can you do? What can you do? Now, if you go on our website, you would have access to a lot of resources. You can inform yourself about what is happening there. And you, given that you, many of you are technology smart people, you can find a way to actually publicize this more effectively because we really want this international outcry and it can only come through technology. The second thing that we're asking is that we asking for people to target large companies in terms of actually getting them to put out statement, but not only just to put out statement, but to lead the way 
in making sure that they don't have any conflict materials in their supply chains. So one of the things we've done is that we've actually promoted a petition to Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, and many of you would know him, to actually create the first uh, conflict-free iPhone. With this first conflict-free iPhone, if they have it, many people in the industry will follow suit. The other thing that we can do, if we, uh, we can write to our technology companies, we can tell them about what is happening in the Congo, and we can ask them to change how they are sourcing their, uh, their minerals. And that can be done actually in the comfort of your own home. You can do it, you can email, and you can write to, uh, to all those companies without any much trouble. The other thing that we're also asking people to do is as voters, we have a lot of power in terms of influencing our members of parliament, especially those who live in donor countries, like in Germany, the UK, Spain, and uh, France, or many of those countries, you can write to your member of parliament or your member of Congress in order to get them to exert pressure on the government so that they will monitor the implementation of the due process, the due diligence process. The other thing that you, we can all do is to write to the European commissioners because what has happened in the US making the due diligence process can actually happen here in Europe and we can demand it from, uh, from, from the EU and they can act on it. So if we do all those things, it will go a long way in actually helping the war in the Congo to end. If we do nothing and we know what is happening, then guess what will happen? So I will end with that, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them and hopefully respond to them. And I, indeed, if there are any comments, those two would be welcome. Um. I want to know if you know if there are other countries that are facing the same issues that Congo is facing right now, and what is the percentage of of trouble that struggles that your country has in comparison with the other countries? Actually, I would rather talk about two countries. I will talk about Sierra Leone and Liberia. Both of them are in Africa. And you may have remembered uh, the Blood Diamond campaign, which led to many people actually questioning their jewelry, their jewelers, where they got their diamonds from. So it's the same thing, it's the same concept, in the sense that in uh, Sierra Leone, they, are, they have a lot of diamonds. And uh, again, just like in the Congo, a lot of armed groups were going about controlling large areas of Sierra Leone, uh, controlling it and mining the diamonds and selling it. And the same money that they were get, getting from, uh, um, uh, from the diamonds, they were using to kill people in Sierra Leone. They were maiming people. So that happened in Sierra Leone. And a lot of activists, said we have to make sure that no one is buying diamonds without knowing where those diamonds are coming from. And through that campaign, a large companies then were compelled to agree with the Kimberley process. Now obviously, the Kimberley process has gone a bit uh, out of the radar, so, and there is a lot of criticism now, but then it actually worked in the sense that it stopped armed groups from getting the money they needed to continue the conflict. And once that money was sucked out, because money is always a big incentive. It was a big incentive in Sierra Leone. It is a big incentive in the Congo. So if you take the money out of 
those armed groups, then effectively they won't be able to buy arms, they won't be able to continue their activities. And that's something that happened in Sierra Leone. The second country was Liberia. Diamond again, and because of the Kimberley process, because of the fact that awareness was raised about uh, the diamond uh, trade, actually Liberia was also benefiting from uh, diamonds in Sierra Leone. So because they couldn't again make the profit to uh, continue the war, again the, uh, the war stopped. And it would then be easier for any other actions to be taken. And in the case of Sierra Leone, there was military intervention by Britain. Uh, and in the case of Liberia, there was military intervention from the US. And the war ended much easier in those two countries. And in the Congo, if we take the money out of the equation, if we stop those people from having the money to continue to commit the atrocities, then how can they get the arms? Then how can they continue their activities? And that's why it's so important for us to make sure that uh, the technology companies are, uh, are not inadvertently funding the war in the Congo. And if we do that, there is a lot of hope. If we do that, we may even hold the first uh, campus party in, Co in, in, in Africa to happen in, in Kinshasa. And, and, and we can celebrate how um, technology can make a difference. I can lend you mine. Hi. Yeah. Uh, no, it's a simple question. Uh, maybe you explain it, but I didn't quite get it. What is actually conflict-free tantalum? Because anyhow, the companies will have to buy it somewhere. Where do they have to buy it from? From which state? Or which is the, let's say, legal political party which is controlling the minerals? That That's kind of unclear for me. Okay. Now... There are two things to that. Number one is that we need that principle to be adhered to. The fact that uh, companies have to uh, know that they should not buy any conflict uh, materials, any conflict minerals, number one. Number two, uh, in the Congo, we have areas where mines are relatively safe where civilians are mining those mines. So those areas need to be protected so that once minerals are sold out, we know that they're coming from those areas. Now, what has happened so far is that militarized zones where rebel groups, armed groups, uh, uh, rogue military people are actually controlling areas. So they're forcing people to mine those mines extracting the minerals and selling it. They get the money, they supply themselves with arms, and they make a lot of profits out of it. So what we're saying is that instead of us continuing to say, okay, we're going to buy from them, we have to stop it. And it, we can stop that. And it is possible to do it. Just like uh, I was explaining with the blood diamond, once the world mobilized, diamonds continue to be sold, but it then became difficult for the armed groups to continue to sell those diamonds. But to start with, you need a clear principle to be established. And the clear principle has already been established, which we call the due diligence process, which already has been championed by the OECD. And uh, a, a UN resolution was passed to adhere to, to, to that principle. The US has already put that as its own domestic law. So there are, interest, there are uh, encouraging signs, or signs already. And even the leading companies, the leading players themselves, are also starting to make an effort to source uh, tantalum from conflict-free areas.
So um, tantalum and coltan are two very precious minerals for smartphone and cell phone manufacturing. Uh, so so I, my this is less of a it's less of a question it's more of a comment. Um, if coltan and tantalum are so precious for companies like Apple, like Samsung, like Nokia, you know, the, the political organization approach is one way to take it. In parallel, another approach is to focus on, on R&D itself. These companies aren't stupid. They know that this is going to become a very scarce resource that's going to raise the cost of production and the cost of the units themselves. So why not as an alternative create a research consortium that Apple, Samsung, and other partners can put money into a fund to fund universities around the world and R&D labs to create alternative forms of producing Thank you. That, that, that's a, a very good comment. And I think, you know, it doesn't go against what uh, we are advocating. Do you know if there's any, is there a research consortium currently in the works in that? Uh, not that I'm aware of, but I know that there are already companies that are working towards conflict-free right. uh, uh, supply chains. Right. So... Uh, there is already movement towards that, and, and uh, companies like Nokia have already put out a statement in terms of how they're going to make sure that they're not sourcing uh, um, from, from uh, conflict areas. Obviously, some companies are saying that in order to achieve conflict-free products, they need to buy the raw material from outside the Congo. Uh, and they can buy that from Brazil, they can buy that from Australia and places like that. But that would be the easy option uh, because obviously we also want to make sure that trade continues to happen in the Congo. Uh, and, and we're asking people to choose the difficult path. Uh, and, and we are able to do that because human beings are not limited. Whenever uh, human beings put their mind to something, they always achieve it. Uh, just like it was almost difficult for people to imagine that uh, the, that the blood diamond will have an effect in Sierra Leone and in, in, in Liberia. It did have an effect. And, and we want the same to happen uh, in, in the Congo. Is there um, an open channel uh, for the, the people in Congo on your website where they can report and communicate what the issues and things that are going on there? And uh, if you could give us the latest, like the most, I don't know, astonished news from the conflicts and the, the struggles? Um, we have a good, strong network within the Congo. Now, this network has not been established by us, but already existed. A lot of activists within the Congo <coughs> are really working to make a difference. So we're tapping into that network. And there, is all, there, there are already websites uh, built by Congolese people within the Congo itself, trying to highlight the situation in the Congo. But the drawback for many of us here is that most of the time it is in French. Unless you understand French, sometimes it's difficult to for, for people to understand. But if you understand French, you can read some of the things that are happening. Uh, there are a lot of activists who are putting out material. So what Congo Calling is trying to do is, it's because we are mostly based in uh, the English-speaking world, we are trying to uh, create the uh, international awareness about uh, what is happening on the ground. So we're tapping into those networks and people are working really hard. Some of them, I have to say, have lost their lives as a result of denouncing what is happening in the Congo. I can think of one who was a very brave person, uh, Shebeya is his name, who lost his life because he was denouncing what was happening in the Congo. So there are a lot of brave people on the ground are working hard and we're trying to make sure that we're relaying the message outside. And 
most of them are in support of what we're doing. Okay, uh, we have time for one more question before we close this session. All right. Maybe a bit unrelated, but uh, what is the environmental impact of tantalum exploitation? Is that also a problem or that has been kind of forgotten by the other humanitarian problem? Or it's not a problem at all? I just It is curious. a huge, huge problem because it's being done artisanally. So artisans are going there, digging with their, you know, they're digging... And, and really uncontrollably, uncontrollably. Uh, and it's, it's, the effect of it is starting to be felt because uh, uh, water is being poisoned uh, and Congo is the second uh, uh, largest uh, rainforest reserve in the world. And you can see the impact it will have, the ecological impact it will have uh, on, on the world actually. Uh, so yes, there is a lot of problem in terms of the ecology. The other thing also that is happening is that the atrocities are not only happening uh, uh, with regard to human beings, but also with regard to animals, for instance. Uh, rare species that you can only find in the Congo are being killed like, you know, there was no tomorrow. So all that pains you. And that's why I'm really encouraging people to, to get involved with this and to, to become more aware because there are solutions that actually can be done, that can actually be implemented. And all we need is actually to mobilize the world uh, around that. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.